All right, hello everybody. Welcome to August Seed Social. My name is Francis Craig and I'm joined here by my colleague Renee Furry. Uh, we have had the honor of hosting a few global seed savers and farmers on Seed Social this year, and this one is no different. Today we're speaking with Indra Shankar Singh, all the way from India, to share a summary of the 2020-2021 farmers' protests and to give insight into how that has affected um, international farmers' protests as well as climate change. Indra is an independent writer and agri-policy analyst. He also served as director for policy and outreach for the National Seed Association of India. He currently hosts India's only agri-talk show called Krizhi Ki Bat Farm Talks on the Wire. Apart from contributing to various national and international media organizations, Indra has traveled all over hundreds of villages across India, working with farmers on regenerative agriculture and seed sovereignty. He's delivered over 200 lectures on agroecology, environment, and agrarian policies across the world. These include invitations by the International Labor Organization, universities, international seed and farmers forums, etc. He's published over 500 articles on environment, agriculture, and politics for various media platforms and is often invited for various news debates on agrarian issues. He also is a guest research mentor at American University, D.C., Indra in his early 20s was mentored by Dr. Vandana Shiva and worked as the campaign manager and media spokesperson for Navdanya. He continues to save seeds and is also an urban food gardener. Welcome Indra, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me and that's a very, I think a very, very large introduction, but thank you. <laughs> and it's always- <laughs> well, I, I wanted to be thorough, so. Um, <laughs> I'd first like to start by asking you to give a summary of the farmers' protest, um, and if you could outline the three bills proposed by the Modi government, and really why the farmers risked their lives to protest them in the middle of a pandemic. Okay, so I guess the story when the, when the story begins, this this begins during the Corona lockdown period, when when the whole country was shut out. People said that agriculture is the only beacon of hope, and I'm quoting directly here from the Prime Minister. He said, agriculture is the only thing that can revive the Indian economy. And after saying that, he does a double speak. And the double speak he does by actually announcing three laws which allow for the corporatization of Indian agriculture. Now, just a short history lesson is that India was ruled by the East India Company for over 200 years. We were a colony primarily which was, which was, based to, uh, which was there to produce agri-goods like opium, cotton, indigo which were then taken by the East India Company merchants and sold other places. You know, that's where the, the profits of the British East India Company came from. That's why we were the crown jewel, because we gave them all the materials that they wanted. So they had the system of agriculture, which exploited Indians, which completely devastated our natural resources, while the East India Company people profited from it. Now, when India became independent in 1947, what we did is we said, hey, we do not want any more corporations in agriculture. The farmer, the tiller, they have the right to the land, not the corporation. Now, I know many of you, you'll be hearing this. Maybe for you, the corporations represent private enterprise, freedom, and you know capitalism. But in India, this capitalism was morphed into a kind of monopoly and, and ol like, a, like an oligarchy, you know, which, which is an, an oligopoly, which is then commanding everybody. You know, Indians were not allowed to engage in it. Only the corporations and the corporate masters using corruption, bribery, controlled the Indian, like, Indian masses. And that's why we had the biggest, uh, or biggest famine, which was there, which is called the Great Bengal Famine. And it was completely, you know, people like Winston Churchill and the officials were, were solely responsible for it because the Bengali farmer could not grow food. He was forced to grow opium. And then that opium was sent directly to the Chinese, which is destroying China. So that's the history. And that's why India didn't want corporations in it. So India said that, well, when India became independent, we organized, we had land reforms, which means that people cannot own as much land as they wanted. The limit was set to 18 acres of productive irrigated land. Now, for example, India also has many agroclimatic zones. So if you are in the desert, naturally you could own more land, but the principle remains the same, that the productivity of that land should not in, be more than the 18 acres of irrigated land. You know, that's how uh, socialist and kind of reformatory our, our, our founding fathers and mothers were. And 
post that what happened is we've also said that well we've seen that the corporations because of their big mar- big margins big money their big control can 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 crush the farmer you know the farmer has no bargaining uh, chip against the big corporations so india said that we will have certain government regulated market yards where farmers will come and sell their produce and there will be a middleman or a middle men or middle people middle persons who are also from the farming community it's it's, it's a democratic coming together of the traders and the farmers and then they decide they come and make a committee it's called the apmc agriculture produce marketing committees which were then responsible for selling certain grains to the corporation so they acted as an escrow account as you may think of or acted as a, as a stock check so that the farmer doesn't get exploited and these are some of the you know the, the principles that india started with we wanted social justice in agriculture we did not want consolidation we did not believe that agriculture is industry so this process started from 1947 of course there were there were changes there were there were multiple things which happened and the us government of course is instrumental in creating and bringing industrial agriculture into india and i'll go that go into that a little bit later but so this is the, the broad framework under which the indian farmer worked it was protected and in and during the covid lockdowns prime minister narendra modi announced that no longer will these protections hold although there will be a land ceiling so the farmer cannot own more than 18 acres but the corporations can now move in directly the cargills of the world can move in into india the walmarts can move into india and start buying and 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 contracting with farmers directly which was not allowed earlier like we've all seen how the contract farming act has actually destroyed millions of homes in america how the corporation entry into into america has destroyed and 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 basically deracinated millions of farmers in america you know like so many people have committed suicide in america they were forced out of their farms because they were not getting the right produce and india wanted to repeat the same experiment because we we were we didn't want to farm for food anymore we wanted to farm for agri dollars so the three three laws that pradhan mantri that prime minister modi got first of them allowed private market yards and what that means is that he allowed instead of these agricultural produce uh, produce marketing committee market yards which were government regulated he said that now corporations can come out and have their own market yards which means that corporations can now control the market directly and these market yards will be tax free whereas the government market yards will be taxed and these corporate market yards will not be taxed further the government came out and said that now farmers can enter contracts into legally valid contracts with the corporations and of course then that was the pandora's box because people thought that what is going to happen now like because of grading problems and other things eventually this will lead to foreclosures so so these uh, so these were some of the things that were that were happening the indian agriculture sector was opened overall that now corporations can enter into the farming thing there were other some minor rules that that were also introduced like for example increasing of electricity cost for farmers uh you know certain certain things about use of old tractors so these were a larger a full scope of things which were introduced to in, to basically to ensure that the indian farmer now serves corporate interest starts going for agri dollars and not real food and so what i'm hearing is that the corporatization of the um of the market in india it leaves indian farmers totally vulnerable to kind of the industrialized global food market as opposed to having their own um internal or more localized control of the minimum and the maximum prices for the crops that they want to be growing and they're also losing the ability to decide what it is that they want to grow because of the corporate power see eventually it would have gotten to that with deber and because the farmer revolution happened farmers marched down to the capital occupied uh, delhi's highways delhi's arterial roads for almost over a year and because of which the government had to repeal the laws and said that well we will not allow corporatization we will not allow corporate market yards we will not allow you know these big corporations to enter and, and end stocking limits and other things so it was prevented but we were going there you know we were on the trajectory and for american for people living in america who, who are hearing this imagine and if some of you remember you know tales from your grandfather and you guys are farmers so 
what happened in america post world war 2 you know when there was there was uh, overproduction prices were falling and the government introduced that well give loans to everybody and what what happened what started then after world war 2 india started india wanted to do the same thing here now in 2020 or 2021 and because of the resilience of the indian farmers that failed now when you talk about the agro industrial agro system keep in mind that the indian agriculture although there are pockets which is safe from the industrialized farming because our farmers are very small small land holding farmers we have our average land holding is is less than 1 acre so people who grow food they are they are growing food for their families they are growing food for the you know for their relatives and just for local consumption but in the certain areas such as punjab up and other places where this industrialized farming has come about and in india it's called the green revolution so wherever you know there is the spread of the green revolution has happened people have forgotten their old crops people have forgotten you know other things which are required in their diet they are just growing agri commodities like paddy like rice and wheat and that is causing a big problem you know the the, the corporate giants and and these people they are so smart they don't they don't want to catch the farmer only one way they have multiple schemes they are like a hydra which which captures you know which which gets to the goal in a very very fast and malicious way so in one way you're pushing industrial agriculture agri commodities uh through the government systems through the government like through the popular kind of when you're making industrial agriculture conventional in this country which is never conventional and on the other way on the other hand through the legislative you're trying to create laws that once the farmer is now ready to be harvested you know and and it's very important to understand that these corporations don't want to harvest the crop they want to harvest people in this country because we've already seen with the case of bt cotton and i'll give you this is a very important example that when bt cotton which is a genetically modified crop was introduced in india it's not that indian farm uh, output and yields increased we had new pests and we had falling uh, we had falling incomes and finally we had dead farmers in over one decade we had we india lost 300000 farmers and 84% of them in the bt cotton belts so these these corporations are extremely smart they have all the stats with them and they this was the final piece of the puzzle so so with the laws if the laws came came in like if the laws had come and they were not repealed we would have finally seen a complete victory a corporate victory and india would have reverted to another company raj and company raj the word raj means rule so we would have gone back to a company rule if the laws were not kind of repealed but thanks to the indian farmers thanks to their resilience and thanks to the millions of people who participated in it we were able to resist it and of course the farmers did also have um, an additional demand after spending one year at delhi's borders was to have a minimum support price for the crops that they're growing now people in america you would remember a thing called the parity program the parity price program which is very very important in the agrarian belts of america in basically this was a program that was i think started by mr wallace who was then the agriculture secretary and this is way back and what they decided is they decided to have quotas for certain crops and and they they paid floor prices for certain crops and tobacco was one of them and and apart from that many other crops were included and if you look at and some of the you know some of the data coming and some of the people who lived through the parity years they'll tell you that that was perhaps the best period for american farmers because they got what they wanted the land was not overutilized there was still some semblance of things and and people could live, live dignified lives but the corporation and so so the same thing india wanted to have a parity price kind of program for 23 crops in which no matter what the farmer grew it was illegal for anybody to buy below that floor price but of course that was never met right now the government of india has initiated Uh, a new committee the msp committee we call the minimum support price msp and what happened there is that uh, first the the government said that we will have farmer representatives in it but once the farmers left delhi they had all their cronies in it while only our, only gave three seats in the committee for the people who were actually protesting and uh, and creating the revolution the farmers revolution in in on the borders of delhi and all over the country so it's a very very uh, i can say it's a very 
malicious design which is which is which which subverted the farmers and although this is the rise of the biggest agro political resistance in the world corporations and politicians come together to kind of subvert it yeah so thank you for for that context and something that i just learned um, by reading your article on a growing culture from earlier this year is that msp did once work for farmers but one of the problems with it was that it didn't um, it didn't account for inflation when um, when the prices of fuel, fertilizer, pesticides, and seed increased, um, resulting in only six percent of Indian farmers getting the MSP for their crops. So I'm seeing MSP as being kind of like this center push um, from Indian farmers uh, as a solution to. Uh, or perhaps a different solution as opposed to the corporatization of their food system. And so if it was adopted as a legal right and it did include environmental costs, ideally, how would the MSP function so that it didn't, um, so that it doesn't you know, fall flat like it has in the past? Uh, see, I think you've, you've actually raised a very important point. And I wanted to set the context first before I jump into that. So see, the history of the MSP is very important because it was actually suggested to the Indian government by an American person. It was Dr. Frank Parker, who then made the suggestion as part of the US aid program to the Indian government that why don't you have a system of uh, where you're supporting uh, certain, the Indian farmers by having by giving them prices which are already predefined. Okay, And now you'd ask, but why was this required? Because then uh, I would like to get into the history of this a little bit because Punjab, which is on the north Western kind of boundary with Pakistan. And this is the area where the Green Revolution, which is aka Industrial Revolution, uh, industrial agriculture was introduced. Now, this is a state that does not eat rice. You know, this is a wheat eating, wheat eating place. So when the Indian government told the people that, hey, grow rice, the, the farmer said, hey, why should we grow rice? And if we grow rice, who's going to buy our rice? Because we don't eat this rice. Right, we we want wheat. We want our maize. We want our legumes. We want our uh, you know lent, lentils, or we want our spinach and and other things, or our mustard. We don't want this rice. You know, this is not part of our food culture. And so the government then said that, well, you don't have to grow it for yourself. You have to grow it for the country. And you know, they gave them that patriotic thing, and I, and I believe, and I believe in the honesty and the integrity of the Indian farmers, the Punjabi farmers, who said that. Well, yes, we should do this for the country. So when they started growing it, they said the government told the government that you need to have assurances. You need to give us market yards which will buy, and you need to tell us a price that will that we will sell our crops at, right? So the government, and that's why the APMC comes into play, and that's why the MSP comes into play. So the government it started in Punjab by creating this government regulated market yards where the paddy could be sold or rice could be sold, right? And they had a predetermined price for that paddy. Now it started out like that, but eventually what happened is that with the rise of and this and mind you, this is also the time when chemical fertilizers and uh, these these high variety yielding varieties are introduced into India, right? Or these chemically responsive varieties are introduced into India. So slowly and slowly, because of artificial subsidies being pumped into Punjab, the farmers started to shift from their original indigenous farming styles, networks, crops, into this green revolution varieties and green revolution crops, okay? And with as the years went by, you know, the soil degradation started to happen. Input costs started to increase. And, 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 and people shifted to paddy. And today, if you go to Punjab during the Kharif season, which is after the monsoon, which is like from June to uh, October or November, you feel that the entire when the state of Punjab is only paddy and people don't even need five kgs of, or I guess five pounds of paddy or five, six pounds of paddy in, in, in a year's time or rice in a year. Okay. So, so that's the kind of change. And, and as the desperation and the agrarian crisis started to evolve, you know, cause in 10 years time, the movement was failing. The, they understood in 10 years time, the Punjabi farmer understood that these agri inputs don't work. That the, agri that the green revolution agriculture does not work. And that's why we have the great insurgency in Punjab, but I'm not going to go on that topic right now. But eventually what this happened is that the Indian, farm Indian government suppressed the farmers till the revolution and spread the green revolution to other parts. 
Now what happened is people started to lose their indigenous crops, their indigenous knowledge, their agricultural wisdom, wisdom and, and getting on the bandwagon. Now today what has happened is, now if you fast forward to 2020, today the situation has become so dire that the fields will not produce anything if you don't put agri-chemicals in it. You need the DAP, you need the phosphates, you need the urea, you need the nitrogen, you need, you need the agri-pesticides to ensure that you have a crop. Otherwise, the pests will come and get it. Otherwise, various other things can happen. It's like a person on drugs, you know, or any kind. Like when you're on drugs, you can keep on going, 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 going. And, but if you don't give that person that drug, the person will just go chaotic. And I'm not just talking about like, you know, psychedelic drugs or anything, but even like uh, anxiety pills and other things and depression pills. So if you're not on depression pills, suddenly you find these pangs of depression and you lose your, you'll get, you start going psychotic. So the same thing happened with the land. After feeding the land 20, 30, 40 years of chemicals, now when you stop giving it chemicals, the land fails to kind of produce anything. So from that point, we have this big agrarian distress which started in India, where, you know, and I think you or viewers will be, will be shocked to hear this, that the Indian farmer does not even make a profit of, of maybe 20, 25 dollars in a whole month. That's the only profit they make. $25. What is $25? That's a dinner for most of you. And that's it's what the, the farmer makes. And for the whole household, and keep, and keep in mind, you know, this is just for the entire household, which is maybe five or six people. So that's why, and then that's why, you know, I come back to the NSP now that what started as an alternative form of payment and empowerment for the farmers Today, because of the dire situation, has become the last kind of uh, support system. Because the prices, because from being the minimum support price, because of bad trade practices, because of bad, you know, like uh, lobbying and, and certain traders who are playing the market and paying the farmers, today, MSP is the maximum price the farmer can get. And I'm talking about a general trend. Of course, there are years in which prices go even beyond MSP. But the general trend is that the MSP is the highest price a farmer can wish for. And I come from a farming family myself. My village is, is in Uttar Pradesh, which is about 650 kilometers like, from, from Delhi, like southeast of Delhi. So all those areas, people don't even know about the MSP, and which gets me to the point of the 6%. So the Indian government itself understands that 6% farmers, and most of them are situated in Punjab, Haryana, and maybe some parts of Uttar Pradesh. They are the only people who get, who get uh, uh, MSP. And keep in mind that in India, 600 million people are engaged in agriculture. 600 million. And maybe 6% of that get the MSP. So you can see how this thing, this MSP, which started with like a good kind of thing, has been subverted. And now it's, it's, it's causing a lot of environmental problems. And that's the other part which I want to touch upon is, is now entire, entire like areas and millions of hectares are now going towards paddy and towards wheat. When we already overproduce, we are already self-sufficient in cereals now. But still, farmers are growing towards paddy because that's the only crop that will get them the MSP and or parity price as, as one would have in America. So even though the MSP is kind of like the um, like the last resort support system, like you said, um, there's still hope for it. And just a follow up question is is how are um, like the SKM the I'm not sure I'm going to say this right, but the Samyukta Kisan Morcha, the Coalition of Farmers, Unions, and Peasants. There was five people chosen from that organization to be on the MSP committee. And so my question is, are they perhaps now maybe organizing to create policy that will support farmers with agroecological solutions because the soils have been so damaged from, you know, years and years of using pesticides and fertilizers and things like that? Like, is there maybe a push for that kind of education and, and farmer resource support and policy? See, there is some bad news, which I would like to tell you that the, the SKM has refused to participate in the MSP committee because it was oh. so one-sided that they said that even whatever suggestions we may give because of 
there are we will we will always be a minority right no matter what we say even if we dissent in the committee we are just three people not five but eventually the government said give us three names okay so there are other maybe like five other names and compared to that you know when that's how committees and i'm sure america you know you also understand that how committees are just sometimes uh, they're just a show they're just a facade they don't actually deliver anything they deliver what the status quo wants and any of you who watched yes minister it's like a british show from the old days they, they they actually spell out how committees are used to just push the power of the status quo and a similar thing happened in india where they, they promised the farmers committees that we'll we'll institute a committee for msp now they instituted a committee which is five of their guys who supported the farm laws and three of the dissenters so millions of people came and they only selected three people to present millions when they had five guys who were representing the government and the corporations and of course they ought to and the second question is about linking ecology and and agroecology and regenerative agriculture to the msp you know and, and i think not every farmer leader is thinking that and the reason for that is we are we are down to survival you see we are not we are here we are not talking about we're just talking about our next meal you know that's that's how dire the situation is that's how bad and and that's how badly the indian farmer is hit especially after the coronavirus lockdowns so they are like hey can we ensure that there, there is an msp of course i've also written about this in many places i've even spoken to many of the leaders some of the leaders actually agree and they they voiced their opinion also that the new msp formula should include water should include the environmental degradation should include soil health should include all these nutrition you know you can't just have a whole country growing paddy when there are not enough paddy eaters you know we need legumes we need oil seeds we need so many other things so why not have some a modern system of msp which includes all these things so just to um to kind of segue into the international farmers protests now i want to first touch on um what is happening um with the dutch farmers protest is the um the relationship with nitrogen fertilizers how that's how they're protesting against um the amount that they're able to use on their fields and then also you noted um before we got on recording that there are other international farmers protests going on and i want to pull in the fact that the farmers protest in india has been described as being the largest protest and demonstration of nonviolent resistance in history so perhaps you could talk speak to the points of how um you know agroecological policy or awareness like the thread of that and also um like the themes coming from the farmers protest in india as being gandhian those two themes as to what we're seeing in international farmers protests thank you and i think i'll begin with your last question first because that's most important you know we 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 haven't touched upon let's see what are the successes of the indian farmer revolution now that the farmer revolution is over it's not that everything is bad and they lost and everything was subverted no they managed to achieve uh, some things which actually shook the nation and not just the nation i you know as time passed i realized that that has caused an international impact also but let's look down to what are the things that they've done so like you rightly pointed out that their methods were highly gandhian india never had agriculture celebrities let's just say that although we are a country of 600 like 1.4 billion people we never had agriculture celebrities we never had you know these agricultural heroes or leaders which people said well i want a selfie with that guy it's not like a agriculture a big farmer is going on a train and people were like hey can we get a selfie with you but this is the first time i've seen that happen with my own eyes like people like rakesh tikat some of the big leaders and i've traveled with them throughout the country you know india is a country which doesn't all speak hindi we have 18 20 languages and a gazillion dialects people don't even know what the other person is saying from north to south okay and the power of the farmer revolution was so strong that even in states such as tamil nadu when i'm walking with rakesh together thousands of people just wanted to touch him wanted to just get a selfie with him wanted to just hear him talk and this happened not just there when we moved to north india the craze was so so huge that we were in a mad frenzy you know that is what the power of the indian farmer revolution was and why was it powerful like because it was non violent because it gave free food because it was rooted in the indianness in the indian civilization and and it's not even like 
you know, India is a very late term. It's just like, you know, the, the resilience of the Sikh community, the resilience of, you know, the, the people in the agrarian communities that took part in it. You know, it was Gandhian and it was almost like, I can't explain, but it's almost like in, in a very way what Jesus would have done in some crazy ways, how to convert your own enemy to your side with love, not with hate and not with like weapons of destruction. So, and I'll give you a little anecdote here. Like these farmers, when they were camping in Delhi, they gave free food to anybody who came there. They gave them a shelter. They gave them, you know, these thousands of hungry children, you know, India is highly malnourished and highly poor for whatever reason, you know, we all know the reasons. But whatever happened, these farmers didn't think for themselves and they fed thousands of children each day at their various campsites. Whoever came to their farms or their campsites actually were given a lodging, were given food, were given clothing if that person didn't have it. And it attracted not just the farmers, people like myself, professional, young professionals, people from the community. This was the revolution of our times, at least for people like me who've lived through it and seen it. So that was the strength. That how the policemen who were guarding the farmers, who were, who were bait and charging the farmers, came back after bait and charging them, came back to eat at the same place where the farmers were encamped. And that's the Christian aspect. You know, that's the love. That's the Jesus coming out of the farmers. And I think that was the biggest kind of organizational strength that they had. Like, how can you organize a million people in multiple locations to be nonviolent? You know, it's a, it's, it's a big, big thing. The second big thing what happened here is that it taught the Indian farmers how to talk. You know, farmers are such people, at least in this country, they don't know how to talk to the media. They don't know what, what the right thing to say. They are just like, you know, they're doing their farming and that's it. You know, they don't know how to come on seed socials. <laughs> but like the, but the thing is that the Indian farmer revolution taught them. You know, now the Indian farmer through the cadres of the Indian farmer organizations and you know other farm unions, they they trained the people of how to talk, how to be confident, how to criticize even more critical things such as the WTO corporations, the Cargills of the world, you know the WalMarts of the world, how they are actually hampering their profits and their the future of their children. So the farmers now understood this. You know this is again a very special movement because. Uh, you know, the world is often divided into the right and the left and people are really, really like into it. You know, like if you're a Democrat, you are a hardcore Democrat. If you're a Republican, you guys will not eat dinner together. Okay. But what this Indian farmer revolution did is it brought the Re Republican and the Democrat together and they were cooking together, joking together, laughing together on an issue based platform. So you had the Indian left parties. And when I say the Indian left, I mean, communist parties. I don't mean like radical Democrats. I mean like the Indian Communist parties who still have a red flag and the sickle and the hammer, you see. So those groups came together with conservative, uh, like hinterland, like for example, in America, I'm sure there are also very like conservative bears in America. So imagine a person from there and a person from New York sitting together and protesting for the same reason. It was that powerful. And that's what this farm revolution did. Like people who don't even talk the same language came together. It was a merging of all political fronts. And maybe the, it, it, it created the foundation for green agro, green politics in India. A social experiment which has never happened anywhere in the world. Now we have, of course, the Green Party in America and in other places. But it doesn't have that mass appeal, you see. And here, people converted it into an agro-based political platform. So that was, again, a, a very big thing. Now... I, I must also mention here that this is not a protest in isolation. It, it's not that the Indian farmers dreamt of it all this on their selves. Like, and this is, this is something new that they did. No, we took inspiration from the American farmers, the, the American agriculture movement of the 1970s and 1980. You know, the tractor case that were organized in Washington, D.C. So we are taking, you know, learning from political movements all over. In fact, many of the farmer leaders often talked about in my own writings, I've, I've highlighted this fact that how whatever happened in America, the same MO was being used in India. Because, because, and why this is happening? Because the corporations that profited from, from closing American farmer homes, from, from foreclosing American farms, wanted to do that to Indian farmers now. And that's why we could catch and pierce the belly of the beast. Because we identified the beast eating up farmers of Mexico, of Brazil, of America, 
of Europe. And this is where I come to your second point of the Dutch farmers. You know, the Dutch farmers and even before that, the Spanish farmers, the French farmers, and very recently, Serbian farmers, they all blockaded their government buildings. In fact, French farmers were so bold that they dumped manure on their government buildings, which I really thought was very cool. You know, the Indian farmers should have done that, but, uh, but we didn't. <laughs> but that is something what they deserve. You know, they deserve our shit. They want us to, to work in shit. They want us to, to be, you know, it's like that Bob Dylan song, come and dig my earth, like um, all along the watchtowers. So businessmen, they're like, you know, you want to drink my wine, but come and dig my earth. So, so that is what happened. And what this Indian farmer revolution taught the world and especially farmers in Europe, because everyone was watching, you know, there was international solidarity, not just in America. I think America had a very strong solidarity for the Indian farmer revolution, especially because of the language and other things. But our methods were immediately picked up. Now, if we talk about the Dutch farmers in particular, what happened is that first, you know, when people talk about colonization, I always, I always tell them that when you talk about, for example, British imperialism or British colonization, it was the British population that the British government colonized the first. It wasn't Indians that they colonized first. So when we talk about farmers, it's the American corporations or the global corporations colonize their own country farmers first before they moved on to eat other farmers, you see? So people who, are, who, who speak against people like dairy farmers, I'm totally against that. First, you talk to farmers how to do industrial farming. You force them into industrial farming. And now when they're on the, on the very end of that process, you want to tell them that industrial farming is bad for you? You took away the agricultural wisdom from the American people, from the, from the settlers who came onto the American land. You took away like everything from them. You taught them new ways. And now when they're mastering those ways, you're telling them you can't do this anymore? You know, I think this is a big injustice. When Dutch farmers, and, and moving back to the Dutch farmers, it was exactly the same thing that happened to them. You know, Netherlands is very, very, uh, very, very good in terms of like milk production, cheese production. They have very, very ancient and traditional ways. So you stopped all that. And then you tell them that you do factory farming. And now when they're doing factory farming well, you tell them, hey, we have carbon credits. Why did you begin with the problem anyways? It's, it's a bit like the mafia, you see. First, you invent a problem and then you put on the solution. So I think that's what happened. They got mafiaed out, like, you know, the Dutch farmers. And that's why they were protesting. They said, we will not shut our farms. We won't do this. And people like the World Economic Forum, you know, they've been pushing these policies when they've been the ones who actually created the problem to begin with. Yeah, it's amazing to see the parallels from, you know, the uh, the United States Farmers Revolution, the India Farmers Revolution, and then also, like you were saying, the Dutch Farmers Revolution, and also just how the methods in which industrial agriculture is, um, is moving through the individual country's food system and how, you know, in the United States, we can see what had ha what happens when corporate takeover is allowed. So now we'll be able to watch India and see what's going to happen. You know, is MSP going to be adopted? Um, are there going to be, you know, policy supported agroecological um, um, avenues for farmers? You know, what's going to happen with the Dutch farmers protest? So it's really interesting to be able to sit back and, and see these different, um, the different ways in which this is panning out for farmers in different parts of the country. And so I also wanted to ask you, Indra, if you wanted to speak to maybe some other threads um, of similarity or perhaps differences within the other international farmers protests. And then also, since we're speaking internationally, if we wanted to move into um, the wildfires and the intense heat waves that we're seeing in Europe this summer as well. See, I think it's a, it's just a crazy coincidence that when the, when the World Economic Forum and people like Joe Biden and other people are trying to bring about this climate bill and new climate for agriculture bill for you know, all these things, that's the time heat waves are happening all over the world. So it's a strange coincidence, but it's happening anyways. So we have to keep in mind that the, the people, it's almost like the people are being told that, hey, guys, wake up. We are now like in a climate problem. And guess who's going to take the brunt of it? It's going to be our farmers. So first from a farming land, America was a farming country. And I'm, and I'm going to come back to America because that's a, your country. I'm slightly more familiar with your ways and, and your agriculture. 
So first, America was a farming land. You through commit like through documents like an adaptive program for agriculture or the Committee of Economic Development, you first start to reduce the size of farmers in the country. So from the 1950s to to now, from where a country was over 60% farmers to 80% farmers, now only one or two people, one or two percent people are farmers. And when you've removed all the farmers, then people like Bill Gates come about and become the biggest landowners. You see, so it's 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 really strange that how all these processes are taking place. And when we talk about climate change, uh, I think it's going to be, again, a very vicious, vicious cycle, which is going to be used. These laws are going to be, again, used against farmers, people who've been really farming, to, to, be, to be thrown off the land. And if you want to know about climate change and how, what climate resilience is, just go back to the natives. Go back to the people who've been, who've been doing organic agriculture in America. You know, you don't need to go to Bill Gates to find solutions for climate. You need to go back to the people who've spent their lives, who've sacrificed so much, you know, who've, who've, who've I can't even tell you, you know, who've heard the scorn of their children because they decided to be organic farmers. You know, how many times must, you know, your, your son or daughter would have told you, hey, father, let's do something else. Why are you doing organic? And you could never explain it. Or as a mother, you could never explain it that, hey, why am I doing organic agriculture? Why is my neighbor getting so much better yield and I'm happy with what I have? So it's a commitment to the earth. Why not we, we, we learn from the people who've done and, and who've sacrificed for the earth? So a climate bill and a climate change bill will never include this. We, you also touched upon you know, the heat waves that's happening in Europe about what's happening in America. And we were discussing earlier also that how there's erratic monsoon now or erratic rainfalls. So why is all this happening? The answer is like already staring at us in, on our face, the writing's on a wall. If you are putting in so much carbon, if you are doing, and I would not even want to talk about the carbon as a, as a medium, but if you're being violent towards the earth, if you're, if you're causing damage to our mother, naturally the mother is going to say something, right? And I am not getting into the jargon of like carbon this and this, that, and carbon credits, that, and all that stuff, because that's in some way also very soon will be co-opted by the corporations. Can we as human beings, no matter what color of skin we have, where we are from, no religion, no civilization, no ethics tells us that you should harm your mother earth. We all agree if we are human today living on this planet, our heart tells us that we should plant a tree. Our heart tells us that this mother, this planet is alive. You see? And I don't need no book to tell me that I should respect the planet. And every one of us innately knows that. So when we talk about climate change, when we, we have to think all the wrong things we've done towards our mother, and our mother has been very patient with us as a, as a young beings, you know, in, in, this, in, this, in this earth, which, is, which has seen thousands and millions of beings come and live and go out as young beings, like how long will our mother take our abuses? So... That's where I'm coming from. Like when it comes to climate change and, and, and doing this, I feel this is, once again, just to reiterate, this is, again, a corporate co-option, which will, again, see the victimization of farmers in America and all over the world as it's doing in Dutch, in Netherlands right now. Yeah, I really do, you know, hope and pray and actively work towards having earth-based solutions, you know, to heal our mother. I just really hope that it's not too little too late because like similar to how you were saying in India um in America too you know people like my generation we don't we don't want to farm we're losing the the memory and the knowledge of how to farm in a way that is aligned with our mother earth in a way that doesn't cause harm in a way that doesn't need uh petrochemicals on the earth and, and these huge tractors and so um by and and so because we're losing that knowledge we're almost like co-opting our our awareness and our trust in a future to the people like the bill gates to the global powers to the people that are coming in and saying that they have all of these innovative solutions so there's these two um two solutions or these two narratives that i'm seeing emerge globally when it comes to how do we approach farming and feeding um and feeding a growing global population um and another point that I'd like to throw in here is how you were speaking to the ways in which the farmers during the Indian protest, you know, they were coming, many people came from different political thoughts 
And even though they had things that were different, they were able to come together because of what they believed for farming, because they wanted to farm in a way that honors our mother earth. And so I'm hoping that we can continue to hold space for that um, as we move forward and work towards a solution, because I don't think there is one solution. You know, I don't think that there is the, the, the model solution for everybody across the globe, but there are, you know, solutions from, you know, as big as the Bill Gates, the industrial food and farming, all the way down to the small, you know, one acre that I've got in my backyard here where I'm, you know, feeding 13 families a week. Um, and so I guess I just really wanted to acknowledge that it's really important to hold space for those solutions, even though, you know, we could be coming from two very different places and that those solutions are worth, are worth validating and, and, and really worth exploring, which, which I know that you, you also believe in, Indra. Um, I guess we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the conversation here now. Um, we've been on the line for about an hour or so, but Indra, I did, I did want to ask you if you wanted to share, um, share anything else. And I also wanted to ask you if you had, um, had any connection to the FAO General Assembly that's happening in India this year, and if there was anything that you wanted, um, wanted to share as that's coming up. Um, see, I'm still I'm getting my thoughts and researching on the, on the General Assembly right now. So I will not it'll be too soon to comment. But I will leave you with a principle. This is the principle that I have followed in my own life. And maybe we don't need one solution. We don't need one hat. But we need one hat maker that can make hats for all of us. Okay? And the principle is that can we reduce violence towards the earth in every action? And can we increase nonviolence towards the earth and all our beings? If we follow this premise, I think whether you're farming, whether you're buying food, whether you're buying clothes, whether you're living your life, whether you're teaching your children, whatever it is, if you just follow this maxim, you will find that the earth will itself guide you to answers. And what we need to improve the earth and our agriculture is love and nothing else. Once you start loving yourself, you start loving your farm, you start seeing plants as living beings as yourself and part of the same consciousness, I think sky's the limit. There can no longer be discriminations. There can, no con there can no longer be hate. So with that, thank you very much for having me today. And it's mm -hmm. always an honor to be with you guys and be part of the Seed Social. Thank you so much, Indra. Those were wonderful sentiments to close our Seed Social. Um, thank you so much for your time and all this incredible work that you're doing with the farmers of India. We want to continue sharing your articles and all of your work or even any new songs that you're helping to co-write. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, keep us posted. And thank you everyone for joining us for Seed Social every third Thursday of the month. You all take care.